Because we'll do it in New York. Finite Center of Colorado College. There's a lot of C's, a lot of consonants. I'm going to get through that one day, I promise. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this roundtable discussion organized in celebration of Diago, the past of this Afro-Cuban present, which is on view at the Fine Arts Center through July 2nd. I think we might be getting an echo. Can you hear that? Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to pause. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. okay. Can you, am I legible through the microphone? Yeah. Okay. Because okay. I can also. I can project. <laughs> so as we begin, I want to acknowledge, I'm going to go as far away from this microphone as I can, and we're going to sit with these fine people in the front row. I want to acknowledge the land on which we stand. Colorado College is located within the unceded territory and ancestral homeland of the Ute people, who are the Southern Ute, the Ute Mountain Ute, and Northern Ute. Other tribes who live and hunted on this land include the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Comanche, and Today, indigenous people from many native nations to the Fine Arts Center of the Colorado College of Public Schools. We are joined tonight with three wonderful guests, two, two in person and one via Zoom. We are, I will, I will say right now, we are dealing with an unstable internet connection uh, in, in Cuba, so please just bear with us as we roll in and out of, of connectivity, but I guess this is the world we are living in, right? Uh, so I want to welcome and thank our guests for being here, Alejandro de Puente, the exhibition guest curator, Andrea Escalera, and of course Juan Roberto Diago, who is joining us from his, uh, his studio in, in Cuba. I want to thank each of our guests for sharing their time, their energy, and their insights with us um, this evening. Each of our guests will offer a short presentation, after which Andrea will moderate a discussion, at which point we'd be more than welcome your questions, your responses, your, your thoughts. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all the folks who worked so hard and with such care to make tonight possible, uh, including and especially Taki Rivera, the Fire Center Curator from Temporary Arts. Savannah Fennell, our curatorial panel professor, Jeff Hartman, our assistant director of events, and Shane Brown, who is keeping all of this tech wizardry running and keeping us connected. Now, I'd like to introduce our three guests. An historian of Latin American and the Caribbean who specializes in the study of comparative slavery and race relations, Alejandro de la Fuente is the Robert Woods Bush Professor of Latin American History and Economics and Professor of African and uh, Latin American Research, I'm sorry, Black African African American Studies at Harvard University. He's the director of the Afro Latin American Research Institute at the Hudson Center for African and African American Research. His most recent book are the award winning Becoming Free, Becoming Black Race, Freedom, and Law in Cuba, Virginia, and Louisiana, co authored with Ariel J. Gross, and Afro Latin American Studies and <coughs> co edited with George Lee Andrews. He is, of course, the curator of Diago, the present, among many other titles. Juan Roberto Diago graduated from the uh, Academia de Artes Plásticas. He has exhibited his work extensively in Cuba and throughout the world, including solo exhibitions in France, Spain, Argentina, Puerto Rico, and Panama. In the United States, he has exhibited in Ciudad Arte and the Pan American Art Gallery in Miami in Magnum Met Gallery and Marble Gallery in New York City, and Time Art Gallery in Dallas, and the Halsey Institute of Contemporary Art in Charleston, South Carolina. In 1997, Diago participated in the 47th Venice Biennale, and his work has included the opening exhibition of the Museum of Black Civilization in Dakar, Senegal, in 2018. Among his most distinguished awards are the third prize in the Juan Francisco Elsa Contemporary Painting Salon, the Sri Amade Malapie granted for the first time to a Latin American artist by the Chacon Foundation in 1999, and the Raul Martinez National Award granted by the Hermano Saez Association to outstanding visual artists under 35 years old in 1989. His works are part of collections, public and private collections across the globe, and we're just thrilled to host him tonight and to host his work at, at the Fine Arts Center. And last but certainly not least, Andrea Ferreira is a published poet, literary critic, and author of a number of books, essays, and journal articles. Her novel, The Pearl of Antilles, was awarded the Golden Quill Book Award in 2005. 
and currently a process of doing it is far before the work. Most recent work, the Cuban artist of the diaspora, studying its entrance into the house, continues to the into the Cuban diaspora history of Cuba. Dr. Herrera was selected for the Fulbright Distinguished Chair in American Studies at Maria Curie at Philadelphia University in Dublin, Poland, in 2006, and has received numerous awards for her teaching and research. She was elected to the 2009 University of Colorado President Teaching Scholar, the 2008 Elizabeth McGee Memorial Lectureship Award, and the 2004 Sarah Phillips Award for Excellence in Research, Teaching, and Service. Dr. Herrera was named a recipient of the 2012 Thomas Jefferson Award. She is one of the five members, excuse me, she is one of five members of the University of Colorado Community to receive the 2012 award among the highest uh, honor given at the Cuban. So please join me in thanking our presenters and, and welcoming here on this lovely Friday evening um, to Paula Collins and, and to the Florida. So, Diago, I think you, creo que puedes empezar ahora. ¿Sí? Diago, ¿me escuchas? Sí, sí. sí. Sí, es que se corta a la comunicación trataré aquí eh, nada todo todo muy bonito espero que esta noche sea de provecho para todos nosotros y que los intercambios fluyan más a menudo ¿me escuchas bien? sí, 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 te, sí. te escuchamos dame ¿Ya? tiempo para traducir Hello. So, so he was saying that uh, I'm going to try to translate ok so he was saying that um, that he's very happy to be here, that he hopes that this will be a beautiful uh, night, and that exchanges like this can happen more frequently. Hey, Carlos. No. Sí, es que no es que se escucha entrecortado. Eh, nada que decía que sería una felicidad, ¿no? Que esto de cambio siempre suceda y bueno estoy aquí a eh, hablar nuestra de, en exposiciones y eventos de otra índole y la gran participación tuya Alejandro en todo este fenómeno que vivimos cotidianamente de problemas de racialidad. He's saying that uh, he's uh, very happy to to be here and that uh, to have an opportunity to talk about um, about a question that he, he mentioned my name um, that is close to my work, which has to do with uh, racism and racial inequality. Bueno, espero para ustedes, lo que quieran. No, pero lo que quieren es que cuentes un poco de tu trabajo. I'm telling him we want, we want him to tell us about his work. Ah, bueno, ok. Eh, mi trabajo comienza desarrollándose en pleno periodo especial, después que me gradué en el 90, en la Academia de Bellas Artes San Alejandro. So my work began in the 1990s, during the so-called uh, special period in Cuba, which is the moment after the fall of the Soviet Union. He graduated from the Academy of Fine Arts in 1990. Fue muy duro porque salíamos de una escuela donde lo teníamos todo, todos los materiales, el óleo. Pero después, bueno, se acabó todo aquello y tuve que reiniciarme desde las clases de historia del arte y veía movimientos que trabajaban con materiales encontrados, materiales pobres, y ahí empezó mi, mi estilo a, a definirse con ese tipo de trabajo material encontrado. It was very it was very hard because um, 
uh, at school, we had all the materials uh, to work with, but then, um, you know, after I graduated, things changed dramatically in Cuba and it was impossible to obtain materials. And at that point, I, I discovered other art movements that worked with uh, found materials, with ephemeral materials, and I began to appropriate those uh, to, to basically uh, use that as a paradigm to develop my own uh, body of work. And uh, he's saying that his style began to take shape precisely in, uh, in, those, in that situation. Y así fue como empecé a estudiar el arte povera, los italianos, Mario Merz, eh, a Tapie, a Burri, eh, a un artista americano que me gustó mucho y me marcó mucho y vino a Cuba, Rochenberg, que vino en la década del 80. And then he mentioned uh, a couple of names that I, that I didn't get, to be frank, uh, but he did say that he, um, uh, found inspiration in Arte Povera, the Italian art movement that uses uh, ephemeral materials, poor materials, in order to produce art. And mention the name of an American artist. Diego, ¿cuál es el nombre del artista americano? Uh, Rauschenberg. Robert Rauschenberg. Okay, okay, okay. Gracias. 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 Mm -hmm. Sigue. Sigue. Fue muy importante porque vino a Cuba y dio conferencias en Bellas Artes, habló con los jóvenes y sus experiencias creativas, cómo hacía su trabajo, y eso me marcó a mí y a toda mi generación. The visit of Rauschenberg was very important because he gave lectures at the Museum of Fine Arts and talked to the, to the youngsters, to young artists such as Diago, and I was, uh, he says that he was um, impacted by that, by those exchanges. Y entonces así fue como comencé a trabajar todos los días. Soy un, un hombre de, de, de despertarme temprano a trabajar el día a día. Es lo más importante, creo, para un artista, el taller, estar todos los días en el taller, estudiar, confrontar las la piezas, y así fueron saliendo las primeras exposiciones hasta hoy. He says that from that time on, he created a habit in which he would work on a daily basis every day. He wakes up early in the morning, and he thinks that the key thing for any artist is to be every day Hello, at the, at the, at the, at the yeah. shop, at the, at the studio, uh, producing work. And that suddenly, I don't think it was that sudden, but that's just me, suddenly uh, the exhibitions began to, the opportunities to exhibit began to appear. And, and he may be frozen. No. Y nada, esa es la historia de mi trabajo. Me invitan ahora a galería, galería, algunos museos. Y bueno, trato de compartir una experiencia. Es muy importante siempre interactuar con el público. And that's the story of my work. Um, you know, uh, suddenly I got invitations from galleries and museums. And um, I think for me the important thing is to be able to to uh, share my own experiences uh, with the public. También es importante, creo, el trabajo en la cotidianidad de los niños, trabajar con muchachos, eh, trabajar en barrios vulnerables, que hoy es una política del gobierno cubano, lo hacía hace tiempo, y no, en eso es lo que estoy. Another important thing has been for, for me to work with children, especially children in, in poor communities, in some of the most disadvantaged communities in Havana. Uh, that has now become a, a policy of the Cuban government to bring artists closer to uh, children in, in poor communities. Well, and, and so, and so you can ask a question. 
estoy aquí para tratar de dialogar siempre. And I'm here to try to uh, dialogue and to have a conversation with you. So, Diego, solo para que sepas, ahora hablaremos, Andrea y yo, un momento y lo abrimos al público. I'm telling him that just that he knows, and then we'll speak briefly, and then we'll open it up for, for questions, okay, from all of, any of you, okay? Sí. So, so. Uh, okay. okay, so that's, that's my translator right. role. <laughs> now, um, now I'm here to speak just on, on my behalf to say, uh, f first to say thanks uh, to Michael Cristiano and to the whole team here at the, at, the, at the Art Center for hosting, for letting us, giving us the opportunity to bring a piece of Cuba and the Caribbean to Colorado Springs. Uh, it's uh, to your beautiful town. It really is a spectacular town. Uh, I have to find a pretext to come back here, okay? Um, let me simply uh, give you, a very briefly, context, text, because Diago, as you can see, doesn't want to talk much about his own work. Uh, and of course, the exhibits don't just appear, and the museums don't just start calling, and the galleries don't just start uh, being interested in your work, as any artist knows very well. Diago comes to age as an artist in a very special moment in Cuba. Uh, it's the end, basically, of an era of, uh, of, of Cuban socialism uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. It's a terrible moment in the 1990s. Cuba undergoes a, a, a terrible economic and social crisis. And one of the, one of the main uh, phases of that crisis uh, was rising uh, racial differences and racial tensions. Cuba be was a fairly egalitarian society through the 1980s. In the 1990s became an increasingly unequal society, mostly because as the Cuban economy dollarized, uh, it mattered who had access to dollars, to dollars and who didn't. And most people got access to dollars from their family members in the Cuban-American community in South Florida, which is mostly a white community. So as Diago used to tell me years ago, in Cuba, dollars are not green. In Cuba, dollars are white. People of African descent suddenly found themselves at a great disadvantage in terms of access to resources, in terms of access to uh, the money with which you could, you could purchase things. So this is, uh, Diago and people of his generation are artists who grew up in a mostly egalitarian world that suddenly collapsed in front of their own eyes. And they had to develop a vocabulary to talk about something that simply was not supposed to exist in a place like Cuba, which was racism. This officially, the official narrative had always been that racism had been eradicated in Cuba that racism had disappeared in Cuba. And you know, if you look at Cuban official statistics, there was in fact some truth to that. I mean, Cuba had made incredible advances in terms of collapsing social differences along race and along many other variables. But all that suddenly began to unravel in the 1990s. And for young artists like, like Diago, the challenge was how do we talk how do we speak about the unspeakable? How do we talk about a problem that is not supposed to even exist and that is not that is recognized not. by authorities? How can we call attention to what is happening? How can we call attention to this growing racial polarization? And um, Diago is in fact part of a broader movement, a cultural movement, not just in the visual arts, also in music with the hip hop movement in Cuba. A group of youngsters, you know, trained and educated by the Cuban revolution. You know, they came out of the schools of the Cuban revolution that suddenly had to find a voice and a way to talk about these things. And when, you know, one of the ways, ways. that uh, Diago uh, has uh, processed this, has dealt with this, is by going back to, is by, in fact, rewriting the history of Cuba. 
from and through the experiences of Africans and people of African descent. And that's why so many of his pieces, as the one you can see here, have referred to history. He says, a piece of my history. If you look at that piece uh, with any care, you will immediately notice that that piece of history, and it is just a piece, because this is the tragedy of people of African descent. They cannot really reconstruct fully their, whole, their old history because there are gaps in their information because we lose track uh, of ancestry because that's what slavery does. Slavery basically obliterates pasts, obliterates genealogies, obliterates personal stories, obliterates uh, communities. So how do you reconstruct your history? How do you try to make sense of your history in a place like Cuba in the 1990s? You start putting fragments together, pieces together, to try to understand your place in that world. And that's why he is, I always describe Diago as a historian who paints. You know, it takes me 200 pages to say what he can put on a, on a piece of canvas, okay? I have to give 10 lectures and five seminars and write two books in order to do what he can do in a few square meters. That's the beauty of, of visual arts. Uh, it's a body of work that has come to represent, in my view, uh, exactly uh, these new voices, these new uh, approaches to what Cuban society not only is, but what Cuban society should be when it comes to race uh, and racism uh, in the island. And he does that. Diago is a, grew up in a poor neighborhood of Havana, in a working class neighborhood of Havana. And in order to do that, he has gone back to, to the deep reservoir of Afro-Cuban culture, which is a resource that was always there available for people like him to mobilize, to re-articulate, and to then use, particularly, but not exclusively, Afro-Cuban religiosity. That was a reservoir of knowledge, of wisdom, of empathy, of support that could be mobilized and that he has mobilized in his work to produce uh, his magnificent work. So, so it's not surprising if you put all those things together that museums did start calling. Not suddenly, it took work uh, that galleries began to notice that something new was coming out of that island, that a new vocabulary was emerging, that a new visuality was being developed. Uh, Juan Roberto Diago has been at the forefront of that, of that movement. And with that, I'm gonna give the, the the floor to my dear colleague, uh, Professor Andre Herrera, who I have to say is the one to blame for this <laughs> exhibition being here, because this is a project that came here in, to a large degree because of her inspiration, because she was uh, asking me to do this uh, here, to come here, and I'm very grateful for her friendship and for her support on that. Alejandro, thank you. Um, so no, I can't take credit. Um, you know, we've been friends for a long time. And when Alejandro first told me about Diago, y hola Diago, soy una cubanita pasada por agua. Um, you know, I, um, I was not familiar with his work. I've been working with artists from Cienfuegos for a long time, but not familiar with his work. And seeing this work um, live has been incredible, you know, and it's been many years since we've been working toward trying to bring this here. But I wonder um, if we maybe could go to slide 16, would that be possible? Because it would be, it would be great to, you know, I just wanna share some thoughts that I have about this work, you know, seeing it for the first time and um, thinking, thinking about my own work with Cuban diasporic artists, you know, artists, yeah, yeah, artists who are outside of Cuba. And so this piece and the next piece, you know, I took this quote from Alejandro that I just loved, um, that history is a singular noun, but history itself is never singular, you know? You know? And you've described um, Diago as an historian and I think of Diago's 
sociological gaze. Because in this painting, particularly, and in the second painting, if we can put the second one that I, I chose to talk about, so many of the themes um, that Alejandro has written about and talked about are embodied in these pieces. You know, this, this really, really astute historical parallelism that he draws in his work, you know, um, a deep, deep understanding, understanding of the fact that in order to be able to speak to the story, as fragmented as this story is, you know, and you see this in, in these particular pieces, that we need to try to reach back to the beginning, as far back as we can possibly um, extend. And what I saw in his work is almost this also archeological impulse, you know, an anthropological impulse to pull pieces, fragments of the past together to try to somehow tell a new story that's an old story, you know? And from a sociological perspective, and this is what a lot of us don't know in this discourse we're having in, in the United States about race and critical race theory and all of these things, is that unknowingly for people who have privilege, you know, who have the privilege not to know this, that we are living out this history that the legacy of the history of slavery, the legacy of the history, Michael, you invoked the indigenous presences here, of the Asian presences, the Latino presences that are here, is that the history we are living now, the cultural moment we are in here, is, is a legacy of this past. And so Diago is pulling those pieces together. Like Alejandro was saying, you know, this, this idea, of course, it was one of, you know, it was part of the triumph, theoretically, of the revolution that, that sexism was a race, that homophobia was a race, that, that racism was a race when the reality is that it was not, you know? You know? And some of the artists I, I, have I have interviewed over all these years, including the ones um, um, in this book about Cuban diasporic art, art, you know, have talked about the reality of racism and, and the intersectional reality of classism, sexism, racism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that has continued to exist in Cuba all these years and that became visible after the special period, you know, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, you know. So immediately looking at Diago's work, you know, that historical parallelism was visible in the work. And then also, I mean, maybe we go to another piece, you know, because I can, you know, I can weave back and forth. Like this piece for me is, is the most visceral, you know, and you people know. have described his work as being like aggressive and visceral, you know? I mean, the suturing, suturing, you know, of these materials together, you know, which not only represents, represents what Diago what... was talking about, right? Um, the fact that, you know, for, for these artists, you know, they have to, this term inventar, you know, they have to improvise, right? They have to use what is around them. You know, one of the artists, for example, Jorge Arango, who I, I interviewed some years ago, was talking about in his sculptures, you know, he had to make nails, you know, and, and any found object, you know, I was showing Patricia and Alejandro today, um, the, the sculptural work of one of the artists I work with in Cienfuegos, who, you know, walking down the street with this man is amazing because he sees things you don't, nobody else sees, right? A bolt. You know, you know, a pin, you know, just a just discarded, you know, no, a, you know, piece you know, of metal and things like that. And so on the one hand that bespeaks, you know, the, the conditions yeah. that artists are working with in Cuba, you know, and the kind of creativity and invention that they bring to it. But it also speaks to this past, past. you know, in this piece, particularly, you know, the, the suturing of these of this fabric, to create something beautiful, to create something whole, 
from all this fragmentation, you know? So that same kind of archeological, what I wanna call an archeological impulse, you see in a lot of the work, you know, bringing these pieces together. You also see, maybe we go to the next one. Okay, this piece for me, and I think of a lot of artists, I mean, I can name some of the artists who are outside of Cuba working, this reminds me of, you know, this, for me, this, this archeological impulse is, is visible here, you know? And, and also in thinking about this work, I was thinking about the work of the first generation of the Cuban avant-garde, you know, who after the Spanish-American Cuban war, were trying to identify what was Cuban. You know, how do we represent an identity that is specifically Cuban, okay? And of course, what, the, what these artists, you know, came to recognize is moving out of like a tradition of romantic art, you know, where, you know, that was emulating and, and imitating, you know, European art forms. How do we find a voice that's ours, okay? And of course, you know, this impulse you see throughout the, the Caribbean, you know, of trying to, to figure out who are we. And of course, who you are, you never can go back. You know, there's a very famous story um, by, by a Cuban writer about, you know, can we, going back to the source, right? But what Cuban identity is, is this history not just of in-migration and out-migration, you know, of, of, of movement in and out, of cultural exchanges, you know, but it's also a history that is made up of all these cultural elements. Like I think of jazz, you know, for example, you know, that jazz is, is a combination of many musical elements that come from different parts of Africa, you know, that come from European elements, that come from, you know, spirituals and religious traditions and work songs, right, and things like this. So what happens, almost like a quilt, right, that you pull together all of these elements and you put them in dialogue with one another, okay? And the history of pain, the history of violence is written in them, but also this, like, future vision. Okay. And so in this piece, you know, one of the impulses of the first generation of Cuban avant-garde was to try to reclaim some of these cultural elements that made up Cuban culture, you know, coming from Spain, coming from primarily West Africa for Cubans, you know, um, coming from the Chinese who entered Cuba, you know. So some people may be familiar with the work of Wifredo Lam, you know, who drew from, from some of these sources, you know. Um, and then, of, you know, of course, um, you, you know, the African presence being most prominent among these presences. And then you have the Taino, right, the indigenous elements. And so I think of, of contemporary Cuban artists outside of Cuba, like um, Jose Bedia, you know, or Joaquin Gonzalez, you know, if anybody knows his work, who are actually taking these elements and putting these pieces together you know, almost like fitting fragments of bones. And, and literally, Diago uses these materials in his work and somehow creating something that becomes whole. Yeah, this piece particularly, you know, exemplifies this. Um, the other aspect of his work, and I'm not clearly the first person, right, who has talked about this, but if we go forward a little bit past this what I think of is this archeological piece. Okay, one back. This is where you see the, you know, kind of these, um, kind of like street art, okay? There was a group in Cuba called Arte Calle, okay? okay? And these were a group of artists who, they were graffiti artists, basically, you know? You know? Who would go out into the street, trying to take art out of the museum you know, of this sanctified space and bringing it out into the public, just like just murals, like murals. you know, and I think you described some of these paintings and you've seen this, those of you who've seen the exhibit are so large, they look like murals, you know, public art in these spaces. And in the case of Artikaya, you know, was very subversive art, 
You know, they would have these art happenings in the street and they would do their murals and then they would disappear, you know? And when I was in Cuba the very first time, there was a group of artists in Cienfuegos doing the same thing. You know, they were doing these murals in the projects and then in 10 minutes, the police were there and they would shut it down, but they put these objects up and then they would be painted over and disappear. And so these elements I see in this work and, and for those who know the work of Jean-Michel Basquiat, who um, Patricia was telling me, Diago had no idea who he was. You know, you see, you see some resonance with some of these artists or here in the United States, Pedro Vizcaino, who is in, in Miami, where you have this kind of incorporation of graffiti, okay? You know, rap plays a huge role. And this is art that takes to task the idea of high art and low art. Who does the art belong to, you know? And how do you produce art, you know, for the public that speaks to their experience? And of course, like, like Alejandro was saying, you know, bringing this voice you know, filling the void of this silence in Cuba, right? And work that, that resonates internationally, you know, in terms of giving voice, visual voice, if you will, right? It's a visual narrative. And, and Diago sometimes incorporates writing into his work, you know, searching for the form to be able to express this experience, this experience that is both human and you know, universal, but also very particular, okay, to a period. So, and the other thing I was thinking is that I was re I was rereading some of the interviews I had done with the artist, some of the artists in Artecaye, who were using materials even like crayons and things like this, you know, and thinking that this is this is work that is produced, for example, by you know children, right, you know, who who speak truth in a, in a very different way, okay? So connecting in those kinds of ways and bringing this art that resonates outside of the space of a museum, right? So I would, you know, one of the questions I would love to ask Diago is just about the politics of the museum and that his work is being contained in museums, right? Instead of being out in the street, you know, for people, for people to share and enjoy. And the last piece, uh, just really quickly, um, you know, this is this huge installation um, that's outside the gallery that people have probably seen. Let me see if we get to it. Which again, you know, speaks to many things. But when I went through this, the exhibit for the first time with, with Katya, I was looking at this piece and I said, you know what that looks like? The quilts of Guy's Bend. You know, I don't know if, if anyone saw the exhibit of these quilts in Denver some years ago, but what these quilts are about is that this is a community of quilters in the context of, of absolute destitution and poverty, okay, of African Americans who are the descendants of the slave, of, you know, of slaves and slaves who belong to the same family okay, the pet ways, okay? And so what they did, and these are extraordinary, the, the Guise Benz quilts, um, is again, found materials, right? Found materials, reusing materials, humble materials, you know, that they would find in the street and stitching them together, suturing together this story, you know, this past, Okay, and creating objects really of unearthly beauty, you know. So entering this space, seeing this piece, and then seeing the way all of all these of pieces were in dialogue with one another, where there was this calibration of pain and violence, you know, um, agony, joy, beauty, okay, newness was extraordinary. So, so being here today has just been an incredible honor um, and joy. And being in the presence of Diago, 
you know, is, is just an incredible honor. So just a few thoughts um, to share, and I'm sure we're going to have an incredible dialogue. Is he back? I think he is. I mean, he's been going in and out, in as and you out? can see. Oh, no. Um, you know, internet, Cuba. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, Diago, tú nos escuchas? Sí, pero escucho, Alejandro, escucho, me escucho. Sí, 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 Sí. Ah, ya, perfecto. Bueno, algo es algo. Ahora te escucho con un eco, pero bueno, te escucho. Okay. Y veo las imágenes que están pasando. Okay. Quería sí. que, comentara, que comentara sobre esta pieza que, que Andrea comentó. I'm, I'm asking him, I'm asking him to, uh, Hola, el paisaje, el cemento. I, I'm asking him to comment on this piece, which is one of the earliest pieces in the show. Bueno, ¿me escuchas? Sí, te escuchamos. Bueno, esta es una de las primeras piezas de mi vida que me dio un premio, el tercer premio Juan Francisco Elso, que se hizo en el Museo Nacional. Y está realizada con cemento y cola, bosque de naturaleza, y a partir del elemento de la hoja, comienzo a hacer todo un... un espectáculo visual. Got that got third that. prize, uh, Juan Francisco Elso. So it was shown in the National Museum of Fine Arts in Cuba. And um, he had to use cement to make the piece, which he didn't say, but basically it's what was available in the neighborhood that he could find. And then he used also glue. And with that, he composed uh, this piece. Y bueno, eh, tiene como una, un referente así, parece como una tela africana de, de bordado. Y nada, así fue como hice esa, esa tela. Hay otra parecida porque esa es la número uno, está la número dos también, que, que bueno, está aquí en Cuba, en la colección. It resembles, uh, it resembles an African textile uh, and it, 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 it seems to evoke that kind of uh, visual reference. And it's part of two pieces. The second one is uh, is in a private collection in Havana. This one belongs to him. Um, so do you open to questions from the sure, audience? maybe ask him about this idea of the archaeological kind of elements in these works. So, Diago, um, tú me escuchas? Sí, te escucho, te escucho. Ok. Um, Andrea, Andrea hablaba de... I'll translate myself. Andrea hablaba de, de que hay algo arqueológico, de una especie de método arqueológico en tu trabajo. Y si pudieras comentar sobre eso. I'm just telling him that Andrea mentioned this archaeological methodology in, in his work and asking him to comment on that. Sí, bueno, buscar, eh, buscar el... indicios, eh, elementos, y bueno, los traigo al presente, los transformo en línea, eh, me interesa mucho la planimetría, tomo la planimetría y la traigo, He's saying that he's very that he's he finds uh, the idea interesting because he's always finding for um, for uh, suggestions, indications of something, and then to put them on a, on a, on the same on the same uh, plane on the same canvas in order to make to make sense of them.
Absolutely. It's worth four. Sure. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, we'd love to give you the... Sí, ya volvió. Es que se va y viene. Sí, ya nuevamente. Oh, thank you, sure. Excellent, thank you. Um, if you could please ask him um, what he was studying um, prior to Rauschenberg uh, and what, he's, what his, he and his generation saw in Rauschenberg, Rauschenberg that perhaps gave them a new vocabulary. I was just really fascinated by that reference and, and what it was about Rauschenberg that um, uh, inspired him. Eh, Diago, la pregunta es que exactamente cómo fue que Rauschenberg uh, impactó tu trabajo y si habías estudiado a Rosenberg antes eh, eh, y las maneras en que crees que influyó tu, tu quehacer. Bueno, cuando estudiamos en la escuela, estudiamos de la, de la cultura de las artes plásticas americanas, estudiamos a Roche, a Richard, bueno, toda la cultura pop. Y en el caso específico de Roche, me interesaba cómo tomaba los elementos naturales, como un gallo, eh, maderas, metales, la técnica celidáfica, cómo ponía todo sobre la tela, cómo creaba un contexto. Y lo mismo hacía con cerámica, no tenía complejo, distinción, a la hora impactó muchísimo. At school, they, they studied several uh, art movements from the, from the United States, including uh, pop art. Um, but what really, uh, what he found fascinating was the Rosenberg's use of uh, natural elements uh, voracious use of natural elements uh, from uh, from pieces of uh, wood or metal to uh, representations of roosters, use of ceramics, and how he had no problem in combining all these elements together uh, in Animales, way, un gallo. Uh, logic. Other questions? I, I wonder if the artist would share what he's thinking about now and what's informing the work that he's making today. Diego, que, que si pudieras hablar de, de cuáles son los impulsos de tu trabajo ahora mismo, en este momento, cuáles son las, las cosas que están motivando tu quehacer ahora. Bueno, ahora mismo estoy tratando de fundir piezas en, en bronce a gran escala, eh, eh, trabajando con madera, madera a otra dimensión. Eso es con es respecto a la, a la, a la forma de, de los materiales en el tema migratorio. Como Muchos de mis amigos, mis amigos muy grandes, muy grandes, como las migraciones, como las migraciones se separan, se separan, no se detienen. Entonces estoy tratando más la idea de un barco me trajo, un barco sigue moviéndose. Eso estoy trabajando ahora en estos momentos. that um, at this very moment he is, I quote, trying to uh, create uh, bronze sculptures. For the record, I have seen the pieces. He's trying very well. Uh, um, but he continues also to work with wood. Um, he's been increasingly, become increasingly interested in thinking about migration because many of his personal friends have been migrating, leaving uh, the island, and this has become a, an issue. And he always thought of, uh, of El Barco Que Me Trajo, you know, saying, uh, I came in a boat, 
because all people of African descent came in boats. But now he's thinking that that boat continues to, in fact, navigate and to move people around in these new migratory movements. Probably don't need the mic for you to hear yeah. me. <laughs> um, we've been reading about over the last three, four years in intensified repression, censorship, and even jailing of artists on the island. Um, what is his take on that, and does he have any hope of uh, any liberalization. Yeah. Diago, eh, eh, una persona de la audiencia pregunta que, han, que hemos estado leyendo sobre un incremento de la, la represión, represión y la censura en, en Cuba, Cuba y, y, y que, que cómo tú lo ves y, 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 y si tienes esperanza o si ves alguna, alguna esperanza de liberalización, de liberalización no, 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 en el en futuro. El futuro. Sí, eh, pienso que en un, no, no diría un futuro, casi ya un presente inmediato, eh, eh, hay cambios en, que se tienen que dar, eh, que mi generación quiere, eh, cambios desde de dentro de la isla eh, para transformarla hacia algo sí, mejor. Mejor, eh, muchos artistas eh, ganan batalla de hacer entender que sí, que podemos aspirar a otra sociedad, no renunciar a, a cosas lindas que se han alcanzado, sino incrementar, cambiando la gente, cambiando ideas absurdas. Y eso sí, claro que va a pasar muy pronto that um, um, in this, um, that he feels that in this very present, uh, there's got to be changes must happen. Um, and they have to happen within Cuba. They have to happen within the island. Um, and that um, artists like him continue to believe that they can articulate a better Cuba within Cuba, uh, a Cuba that keeps whatever was beautiful or whatever beautiful has been built in that country over the last few decades, but that uh, at the same time destroys all what he describes as absurdity happening uh, in yeah. the island. Would you ask him the question about the, like where does the art belong? Is there tension for him housing his art in that very elite space of the museum? Okay, I'm going to ask the question, although his work is now in a museum, and we're grateful for yeah, that, okay, yeah. Michael, for, for the record. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Diago, la pregunta que, que hacía Andrea es, si tú sientes que hay una tensión en contener tu trabajo dentro del espacio del museo, eh, quizás puedas tú hablar de los proyectos que has hecho que son más eh, proyectos fuera del museo, I was also inviting him, uh, apropos this question, to mention perhaps to say something about projects that he has done that are art, uh, street art projects, projects that are not in fact with the museums or are public art uh, projects. Bueno, sí, he hecho proyectos fuera del de museo, pero ahora está. Pero la pregunta es... Barrio, en, donde aquí ando unas cosas en, en población rural, en Soroa, eh, con un grupo de mujeres, que, bueno, no quiero anticipar porque me gusta siempre hacer las cosas y después que se vea. Pero estoy haciendo unas cositas ahí que pronto, pronto saldrán a la luz. Eh, con ese grupo de mujeres empoderando a la mujer rural. Eso me tiene ahora mismo metido de lleno en eso. Oh,
this is this sounds like an advertisement, but I'm gonna. Kucha, he's saying that he's now yeah. right now working on a project with um, with a group of uh, rural women, uh, a group of women from rural Cuba. That is a project that seeks to empower these women. And then he says, this is gonna become public very soon, but I don't really want to talk about it until it happens. That's the advertisement part, I think. Um, but this is in fact something that he has done consistently in his work. He has done many works uh, of, uh, of, public, of public art, including many installations that were for, for a long time. And they were installed in some of the very barrios where the materials came from, where he has found those materials. He would then make some installations in those very barrios and people in the community would interact in different ways with, uh, with the installations. Other questions? So, un par de preguntas, Tiago. Una sobre, eh, sobre el, las costuras que usas en tus piezas para atar fragmentos y también las soldaduras que usas para conectar fragmentos en los metales. Eh, que ¿Cómo ves tú? ¿Cómo interpretas tú? ¿Cuál es tu visión de esas, de esas intervenciones? Y la otra pregunta es sobre los materiales. Si estás tan eh, dedicado ya al uso de estos materiales pobres, que no piensas en otros materiales, o si estás pensando en nuevos materiales, o ¿cómo lo ves? Bueno, todos los materiales que empleo refuerzo. Eh, las ideas sobre la exclusión, sobre el racismo, eh, los materiales que incluyen, esos que lo trato de representar, me ayudan esas maderas fragmentadas. So he's saying that all the materials that he uses, David, and continues to use, uh, he uses them because they help him articulate uh, narratives about exclusion, about racism. That's why he uses broken pieces of wood. That's why he uses a metal so he then connects with these weldings that are like scars. You know, they're, they're put together in scars. Scars is what connects the fragments. So the scars, which began as a kind of, this is now me speaking, not Diago, okay, just for the, for the sake of transparency. The, the scars began to appear in his work and the fragments that appeared in his work since very early. If you look at some of his most recent pieces, they look almost abstract because, because the fragments the fra have become the, the narrative. He just cannot escape the, the fragments. So the, what, what began as a kind of visual cue has become the narrative of, of his work. Connected to that, I wondered if you could ask him about... I don't think I can ask him anything at this very moment. I, I have the, the impression that he's frozen, but... Yeah. Maybe not. 
¿Tú nos escuchas, Diago? Sí, eh, se escucha entrecortado. Se cae, va, viene. Oh, no, no. And the connect, some of the connections. You mean the wood installation? Yeah. And you can see that in other work, too. But, you, can you know, there, there are elements you that can connect. That okay. <laughs> okay. You don't need him. <laughs> bueno. He, he likes to bring me to work. I know. <laughs> he speaks better Spanish than I do. Um, Diago, si puedes escucharme. Quería saber si había una influencia de como los cubistas y, y por ejemplo, yo vi M Mondrian en su trabajo y, y la idea de fragmentos de una historia que está fragmentado, que para ver otras perspectivas, um, para ver para. arte en un, una manera diferente. Y también el tema de, de um, ¿cómo se dice? Como high art y low art, como arte bajo y arte que es... Um, arte popular y pop, arte fino. Sí, fino. Y, si había una influ, influencia o si, si puedes notar como un paralelismo de, de ese arte y tuyo. Ah. Yeah, I love I love young people. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, it would take me two hundred pages to discuss. Yeah. yeah, maybe we can just call him. <laughs> maybe yeah. we, we are recording this also. Oh. oh. You can hear. It. Um, yeah. Any of my students would have thought about this, like yeah. like you, immediately. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> La, um, we could put him on speaker. Um, yeah, I think it has to be you. Part of the question I asked him too is in relation to cubism, you know, one of the impulses in cubism was to pr try to present reality, reality in a different way with multiple perspectives. And you have that same kind of fragmentation um, in the work of the cubist the artists, you know, pr you know, again, no, again, I kept thinking about Mondrian and thinking about how they were also using like various forms and materials, including found materials in their work to create something new. Um, so I asked him if he would comment on that. And also this idea of high art and low art, you know, the Cuban artists, the Cubist artists, See. raising questions around you know, popular art. Sí. Tú, tú sí. viste la última pregunta sobre posibles influencias cubistas, Mondrian, en tu trabajo. Sí, por aquí se escucha mejor. Ok. Sí, ya, por, Pero escuchaste por aquí se esa pregunta. Escucha mejor. Well, welcome to my world. This is Cuba. Ah, no, no, pues, eh, no, no, puedes volver a hacer. Eh, eh, puedes responderte, voy a poner en el micrófono. Pero pregunta, coño. 
que la pregunta, la, ah, es que no viste la pregunta, la pregunta que hacía, Pero pregunta, que hacía Andrea era si tú, si hay influencias cubistas en tu trabajo, porque ella veía algo que pondrían en, en, en el rostro de la verdad, en tus instalaciones. Bueno, eh, te puedo decir que sí. Bueno, eh, eh, acuérdate te puedo decir que, que nosotros sí tenemos una formación y no, eh, acuérdate que académica tenemos fuerte, una de, de, estamos viciados de toda la producción fuerte, simbólica. De, estamos viciados de toda la producción simbólica africana y oriental también. Y entonces ah, cuando uno está creando africana y oriental también, todos esos ángeles entonces, a la mente, cuando uno está creando, y Mondrian vive en mí, todos claro. esos ángeles a la mente. He's saying yes because, as you know, we our formation is, and he used the term viciado, which is to say saturated, is by Western references. And somebody like Modrian lives in me, and those references are always part of my of my work. Um, um, I think he's trying to convey that uh, art education in Cuba is very much a Western art education. I think there was a question there. Yeah, uh, this, this is of a personal uh, question. Is he married? Does he have children? And uh, are these children involved in his art? Es una pregunta más personal. La pregunta es si estás casado, si tienes hijos, y si tus hijos están participan o están involucrados en tu producción artística. Sí, bueno, si sí, yo están los tres en mi producción artística, son como mis ángeles, que me dan fuerza y energía, que me dan fuerza y energía. Mi dos hijos del primer matrimonio estudian en la escuela de arte que yo comencé en el cerro. En la escuela de arte que yo comencé en el cerro. Violín uno. Paulita y la niña, violín uno, el chelo, y la niña pequeña está allá estudiando piano. Y la déjame, déjame traducir. Pequeña está allá estudiando that, uh, piano. His um, three children have have been part of his art since uh, since they were born. They're the three angels who inform his uh, his work on a daily basis. The two children from his first marriage. Uh, are already in art schools. One of them is studying violin, and they're going to the same school that he attended many years ago. And the the, the smaller the smallest children, the, the youngest one, is a daughter. She's studying piano now. So, um, just for the record, when he, when Diego was very young, his grandmother would come get him from the street he wanted to play you know like baseball or something like all kids do and she would take him to the museum on on weekends and he was always uh, complaining about that but that she was a great she was an enormous influence in, in in his life she would take him there because they would offer classes drawing classes at the museum and she would take him there every every weekend for one more question? Okay. Anybody have one last question? Um, I work at the Fine Arts Center. So I walk around, um, I walk around this gallery a lot. Um, and I'm a history philosophy major, so I have um, it's I'm really happy that it's there, even given the, the complexities and the tensions that uh, you alluded to. But I was going to ask about the relationship of imagined futures of the past, um, hope, and utopia. So those are three sort of key notions that I've been thinking through as I walked the galleries. And I was wondering if there was any sort of um, if Diego could comment on any of the three, all the three. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent question. Diego, la pregunta que viene de una estudiante que ha estado pasando por las galerías y mirando tu trabajo. Ella se pregunta cómo, qué tipos de futuros se pueden imaginar desde el pasado que tú reconstruyes 
y si hay esperanza y utopía en, esas, eh, en ese proceso. ¿Me escuchaste? Está en la misma pregunta. Sí. Reconnecting. Reconnecting. Dovía, sin may, sueño, may eh, sin amor, idea. mejor no vivir. Y sure claro que hay, y que hay esperanza, por muy malo que sea el futuro, tiene que ser mejor que este presente. Y nada, las nuevas generaciones... la pregunta? Eh, lo harán todo. Estamos dando nuestro granito de arena, pero sí. Pero sí. Claro que va a ser mejor. Me a ser mejor. Di Diago, Mucho me escu mejor. tú escuchaste la pregunta, pero yo te perdí. perdí. Sí, sí, escuché la pregunta. Eh, sí. sí, sí, escuché la pregunta. Eh, sí, que creo en la utopía, en el sueño, en el amor. ¿Me escuchas? Okay. Hola. Te, te, ese sueño. Te volví a perder. Te, te volví a perder, por favor. Creo así, yo creo en eso. Que ese mundo tiene que ser el mejor. Ah, bueno, ah, bueno que te digo que sí, que yo creo en la utopía, en el amor, en el, amor, en el sueño. sueño que, que, por muy malo que sea, que, por muy malo que sea presente, este presente, será siempre será mejor que el pasado. So, he's saying, let me, let me translate quickly before I, I lose him again. He's saying that, that uh, by all means, he does uh, think that uh, a better future is possible. He believes in utopia and that uh, he hopes that his work conveys love and hope, even if it is produced in this very difficult present uh, that he cannot really escape. And perhaps, and that's why I put this piece on the on the, on the wall because it's uh, this piece is, is titled "Self-Portrait Autorretrato," and that self-portrait, as you can see, is first stitched together. It's kind of put together with these fragments, but there is kind of a reference to blood in there, to the pain of being uh, of being a, a person of African descent. Uh, in this world we live in, but it's also a history of uh, of love. It's not a history of just anger and pain. There is a, there is love in that, in that history. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight with us. Thank you, Diago. Thank you to Diago. He says, Internet is torture, but I'm here. This was the first. Okay.